I'm Aaron Capulli. I'm one of the hosts for the CCH podcast. As you see, we have various people get on like DJ, Ben, Josh, Amelia, Drew. And we also are joined sometimes by special guests like Sean and some others that you'll see in the future. But with that being said, uh, let's go through clockwise and we'll have everybody announce themselves and say what they do, who they are and stuff like that for maybe some new viewers. Uh, yeah, so my name is Sean Murphy. I am a former zookeeper uh, with uh, just over eight years of zookeeping experience in AZA zoos. Uh, currently, I'm an operations manager for Proust Pets in Lansing, Michigan. So yeah, I'm Drew Keynes. I'm a grad student at Clemson University down in South Carolina, um, and I'm studying biology and specifically looking at salamanders. So yeah, herps are kind of my thing too as well, um, uh, more from a research perspective currently. Oh yeah, my question for Sean was, how does it look uh, in a zoo setting? When do you ever try to, in your experience, um, facilitate some of these like seasonal behaviors or certain behaviors, um, whether it be through uh, captive rearing for breeding purposes or just some type of enrichment? Like, what does that look like for herps specifically? Um. Yeah. I mean, it's it kind of goes like on a zoo by zoo basis, and then also animal by animal basis. So. If you have an SSP animal, which is the species survival plan, so an endangered uh, animal, there's going to be a breeding recommendation. So at that point, like, yeah, you'll do like the seasonal changes and brumations, photo period changes. Um, like specifically, I've bred Puerto Rican crested toads, Panamanian golden frogs. I've attempted Iranian newt breeding um, and a few other like random newts and salamanders and uh, basically, yeah, you just follow like what their wild protocol is, you know, as we change throughout the season. Um, like at Tampa, for example, I had a separate room for like a lot of my amphibians. And so for some of the Florida native species, um, once fall hits, like every week, I would drop the temperature in that room by like three to five degrees. And then throughout the winter, I'd get it down to where that room was consistently like 45 or 50. And wow. then spring would hit and I would just slowly rise it back up. And for a lot of my newts and salamanders I had, I just, I had them dry out for that time. And then I had um, like the big, uh, can't remember what the bins are called. They're, they're like storage bins you use in a restaurant, like the hard plastic ones. Um, but I just drilled them, uh, you know, with a, it had like a PVC stanchion into them hooked to a bulkhead. And I would have the, the PVC stanchion as high as I wanted the water to go. And I would just miss them every day or hook up a mist king and just let that water level rise and rise and rise until I could uh, inhibit the breeding process with them. Um, as far as animals that aren't SSP though, it's a great like enrichment idea. You know, like even my animals here at home, like they live right next to my living room and there's a window right there. And I watch my Savannah monitor and my snakes like change their types of periods based on time of year. You know, now that like the days are a little bit longer, my monitor is out all the time, like looking for food. My turtle is way more active. My snakes are out front all the time now. So I always recommend it no matter what. I mean, it's not going to hurt. Like my my whole thought process has been if we're going to have these animals in captivity, make it as natural and comfortable for them as possible. So like all my setups are as natural as they can gain, get can get. And then like yeah, I'll put them through like photo periods and brumations and everything else just to kind of keep like a natural cycle going. I have a yeah, question related to that for you. Um, yeah. So this is something I've been kind of trying to puzzle out at work. Um, so if you have animals that you are hoping to breed at some point, that they would experience some amount of seasonality in the wild, whether that's just temperature or rainfall based or both, um, and they had previously been kept in an environment in captivity where they were not really experiencing any of that kind of seasonality. They were just being kept at a basic consistent level of temperature and humidity that it was acceptable, but it was just kind of mid-range um, for years or whatever. And you wanted to try and get them onto some sort of a seasonal cycle to hopefully induce breeding since that hadn't been successful yet. What's the best way to go about starting to do that? Like, do you want to try and match it to our seasons here in uh, Northern North America? Do you want to try and match it to what their uh, 
cycle would be in their native range, if that's like South America or something? Does it matter if they were captive bred versus wild caught? Is it better to start with like the cool or the warm season or the wet or the dry? Is it just all very much depend on the species? So to answer like kind of all those questions in the one, match it to where you're living because okay. there's barometric pressure differences uh, there's temperature differences and uh, photo period differences on all those things. So if you're trying to mm -hmm. match a South American or Australian species to what you're doing in the northern part of North America, it's not going to match up. So they will match to what we have here. And whether they're wild caught or whether they've been in captivity for a while, you, you literally just jump right into it because you're talking about millions of years of a constant with these animals. And even if they've been out of the wild for a year, five or 10 years, they can jump right back into it again. Um, the main thing is that like, it's a slow transition, you know, that you're not just immediately dropping like your turtles or your snakes down to 30 degrees after being at 70, you know, just like let it like slowly go down like it would out in the wild over the course of a, a couple of weeks or a month. And then, you know, they'll go into their brumation or torpor or whatever it is that they go into. And then you just kind of raise them back up and out of it again. Okay. That's a good answer. Yeah. That's what I do with my newts here at home. My basement's cold. I literally mm -hmm. put them in a tote with like eight inches of dirt and I put them at the bottom of the stairs where it's like 65-ish rather than 70 upstairs. And then I move them closer to my cellar where it gets closer and closer to 50 degrees. And I just do that over the course of like a week or two. And then I just leave them down there for like a month and a half at 50 degrees taking in all that cold air off my cellar door, and then I start to move them back upstairs again. Nice. Those are a lot of questions, Amelia, that I had the chance to do a, I don't want to say a literature review, but some type of paper for my undergrad um, to understand like brumation cycles. And there's a paper, uh, it was one that we talked about before with DJ. It was the same one where uh, Harding in 2015 raised questions about uh, captive breeding programs and about like, uh, if we keep different species, how should we keep them? So that was actually a question that was framed into that paper. And oh, yeah, I remember you referencing that one. Yeah, it was a really big part to that literature review because it was somebody who finally was, like, skeptical, but also, like, still talking about the need for it. Um, but, yeah. So how I, close was Harding said then? <laughs> you were, I mean, that's a, essentially what he argued, but he argued that we shouldn't keep animals that are outside of their geographic range because um, it's not as precise, but this is more for endangered species. So like, um, you know, he wasn't talking about American toads in Michigan or in Pennsylvania. Um, I don't know where he would have stood with White's tree frogs because of their variability, but the more critically endangered, like more uh, advanced frogs, I think he was arguing, but I could be wrong. Maybe he meant all of them. Um, it was very fascinating, but yeah, the case was being made by the um, different researchers. He brought up even that the best way to do it is to cycle it with your, um, how do I want to put it? So like the Northern Hemisphere experiencing summer in June rather than in like December or whatever it would be to have them like Sean was saying, in June instead of December, because if you do it in December, they're not going to match up as well. So like what he was talking about, I mean, that's exactly how you want to do it. For the native species, it's a whole different ball game. 